And I want to talk to you about a point in time where I think technology and human growth are going to intersect, and that might allow us to build the world's next education system. Some months ago, Cadence from economics faculty at UM reached out to me and said, hey, Sina, I've read your blog post and your Facebook post, and I've seen the student club that you and your friends started, and, and, and we think you should give a TEDx talk about it. And I was well intrigued, and I said, yeah, sure. And well, she's right. I've spent the past couple of years of my life thinking about a particular in world's education. And the more I've explored this problem space, the more, the more I've realized that maybe people in the higher education ecosystem don't really have a solution for this major problem in our civilization and not even a plan to sort of address it. My concern and my uh, worry about that was validated last year when I attended the International Association of Universities conference. And this is where I got to meet a lot of amazing thought leaders from all over the world. In, the field of education, and at some point in this conference, I got to meet a gentleman from UNESCO who said, we know what we're, in higher education, we know what we're trying to move away from, but we don't know what is that vision of future of higher education that we're trying to have. We're driving the education from the rear view mirror. That's a very powerful statement. I find it equally scary and exciting. It's scary because, well, we have a problem, but not a solution for it. And by we, I mean the human race. And it's exciting because, well, we have a problem, but not a solution for it. It kind of feels like an open invitation for somebody to do something about it. And I think that we don't grow, and we don't grow wise by just redoing what the previous generations have done, but also by tackling some hard, unsolved, and untouched problems in the world that somebody need, need to do something about. Generally speaking, when we talk about education, most conversations don't cover, they cover minor problems and they come up with minor solutions. And sometimes we fail to radically rethink and question some of the more important stuff in education. For instance, it's very rare to see people asking, well, what is the goal of education system? I met another lady at the same conference and even though, well, she was also from UNESCO and she said that this was her personal opinion and not representing the organization. And I think that a lot of higher education institutions may say that, no, this is not what we want. But well, she said that the goal of an ideal education system is to enable individuals to fulfill their potentials so that they can become great workers. This seems to be a dominant point of view in education. And since it's been there for quite Quite some time, it makes me question, well, why is that the goal? Why do you want to create great workers, for, in for instance, and not, say, great humans or something else? And the fact that this goal has, this is nothing new, by the way. It's been there for such a long time, which also makes me want to ask, well, since it's that old, is it still valid today? It's a great thing to pursue today. And some people may say, yeah, absolutely. You know, in order to get a life, you need to get a job, and therefore, you know, employment is important. And therefore, to have an education that caters for that is important. And I think that's a fair argument. It's just that the sort of jobs that you would have 50 years ago or 30 years ago are very different from the sort of jobs that you'd find today or in 10 years or in 30 years. And I start thinking maybe we've built an entire education system on top of a demand that is constantly changing without the system being able to adapt to it. And then some people may say, no, that's really not the case. You know, look, you've studied AI and you couldn't study AI 30 years ago. The system has changed and it has adapted and we have technology and bare facilities and bare campuses and all this. And I think, again, that makes sense. It's just that in the context of education reform, that's just small talk. Same goes to asking questions like, how should the classroom look like? What languages should we learn? What skills are important today or tomorrow or things like that? I think these are important conversations to have, but they are really small talk. And the main problem is something else. I'm here today to sort of brainstorm these ideas with you about the main problem, knowing that by the time we have something better than this, most of us here may not even be alive. Well, I wish that whatever I'm about to tell you here, I wish these things would come through sometime in the next 30 years, but I also think that it's realistic to expect a real change sometime in the next 50 or 100 years, uh, which might indeed be a reason why a lot of people are not talking about this, but well, here we are thinking about this. To understand the main problem, I guess it's a good idea to take a little quick dive into the history of education and go back in time to a point where education was a privilege for the elite. Not everybody could afford education, and if you could afford education, you could probably also afford having one teacher per student. And the goal of that one, that one wise teacher would be to use the understanding of time and civilization and all these things 
and come up with one growth plan for that student and then figure out how to take this student from here to that goal. And then time passes by and we have, well, capital in the West and faith and values in the East sort of democratize education. Now more people can get education and you can see formation of little classrooms and neighborhoods and villages and here and there where families trust a wise member of community or a religious figure to take charge of their kids' education. And at this point still, it is beyond that person to use his or her wisdom to say, okay, this seems to be the, the great thing to learn. And then the teacher would also figure out how to learn that thing. So if you went from this neighborhood to that neighborhood from, or from this village to that village, you could probably f find very different things being taught in different ways. And then in, obviously industrialization happens and governments say, hey, people seem to love spending any hours in their day learning stuff. So what if they were learning the right things? And that could probably you know, grow our nations and we could be more productive and then it would be better for everyone when your nations are more productive. And it made sense, it was a good idea. So they regulated education just like anything else that gets democratized. At this point, with standardization and centralization of education, one thing changed. You would no longer have one teacher for one or few students. You would have one teacher for many students and one system for all students. Whenever I think about these personalized education versus models of the top-down models of controlling what masses of people learn, I sort of imagine this picture, and I think all of us have seen some variation of this, except before talking about the thing that I really care about in this picture, there's one part of it which I really disagree about, disagree with. It kind of implies that the teacher is imposing her thinking on the students, which I don't think really is the case because, look, you can't go to school as a teacher and say, hey kids, I'm not going to teach you arithmetic anymore this year because we have too many engineers. Let's learn poetry. You just can't do that because it's not your call. So I think I have a problem with that. So let's just not look at that. So the thing I want to talk about is that circle above the student's head. So what is that that we're transforming into a circle? Somebody could say that's creativity, that's, I don't know, skills, it could be worldviews, this and that. To me, though, that is your potential. Potential means something that you're not, but you're capable of becoming. I think students go enter, all of us, we enter education system with a great potential and a hope and trust that the system is going to grow us into the best thing we can possibly be. It's just that the system isn't really trying to make us the best we can possibly be. It has a particular thing that it cares about. So if the circle was your potential, the square is probably the part of your potential that the education system cares about. And if you spend enough time in that system, this is probably the part of your potential that you're going to keep. And this might be the part that you lose. And you may look at this and say, well, this is not an entirely bad, I mean, it is a loss, but it's not a very big loss. I mean, just little edges here and there. And I think, well, fair, that is really small. But the thing about potential is that it grows over time. With the same body and IQ that you have right now, if you lived 200 years ago, you would have a remarkably smaller potential than you do today just because technology has empowered us and it allowed us to be able to look at the whole world and, you, and know how far we can go and how much we can achieve. If you lived 200 years ago in a village and everyone there was farmers, whatever you achieved in your whole lifetime would be a slightly better or worse than all those people, unless you got really lucky. So say that was your potential ages ago, and maybe this was it a decade ago. I think this is it today. And yes, the system has improved a little bit, but the loss is pretty damn big for our civilization and how much we can grow collectively. And I think that happens because we've built this system in a way that is tied not to the core human values, but to all these external, ever-changing variables which are temporary in our world, such as market, wealth, industry. We know these things are changing, and we know that this human-made system cannot adapt to these things, but we still thought it was a good idea to follow those for our education. So what do we do about it? I think the, an the ancient model seemed to work pretty well back in time when we had one teacher per student and one education system per person in a way. But we, we don't exactly want to double up our population and go from 7 billion to 14 billion and we'll hope that those new 7 billion will be happy being a teacher for the rest of us for the rest of their lives. I mean, we could try, but I don't think we should. So maybe then we could try to know enough about each person to give them the education that's right for them. But then even if we did know enough about all these people, then how would we even process that amount of knowledge and how would we compute that? But we have technology. But a lot of people are kind of scared of technology and AI particularly, which I think is fair. And I want to come back to that fear because I think it's important. But for now, let's sort of try to brainstorm 
So if we were to bring that back, to have a personalized education system today for everyone, what would it take? I think we should also learn from history, the way they did it. The old wise teacher would start with the goal. They would start with why. What goal am I setting for this student? And after that goal, they would say, okay, so how do I take you from where you are to that goal? So we need to also do that and say, okay, what are the goals of the new system that we're thinking about? I'm not here to tell you what those goals are because we live in a time of relativism and we have a thousand definitions of right and wrong and good and bad, and I think we're still kind of fighting. So I just merely want to, I don't want to be the problem solver here. I want to be the facilitator of this thought process. I don't know what those goals are going to be. I'm just optimistic that the human race will eventually agree on those and we will figure out the things that truly matter to all of us. But here are some criteria that I imagine those goals should have whenever we find them. They must be timeless. We shouldn't need to come back to this every month and year or two years, revisit them, rethink them, because we base the whole system on something that is constantly changing. They must embed our core human values. Somebody in that same conference that I talked about earlier once asked me, hey, I was a panelist there, I gave a speech, and after that they asked me, hey, look, how, how do we encourage your generation to care about environment? And I said, it was harsh, but I said, well, you don't. I went through an education system that wanted me to become a great worker. I, I think I'm a pretty great worker. I just don't care about environment. And maybe it's because I spent 20 years at school and less than two weeks in the nature. And the top 10 things that I care about on a daily basis have to do with wealth or health, and that does include the people in my life, the family, and here and there. So what do you want me to do? Sacrifice my career and my relationship and everything to care about environment? We need solutions, not sacrifice. Sacrifice is not scalable. The goals for the next education system need to address diversity. It's very hard to talk about a solution that addresses diversity, but it's very easy to explain why we, why we have failed at this so far. The thing about diversity is that when you have a large, diverse group of people, and you want to cater fair growth and equality of opportunity for them, first you need to understand them. Because if you don't understand them, then how can you say what's good for who, right? But then the challenge about understanding people is that, especially a lot of people, a lot of diverse people, is that, well, you can't know enough about them. So then we became, we split into two groups, the human race. One group said, okay, because there are so many people with so many different opinions and everything, let's put them in groups, tie their identity to these groups, because it's always easier to cater for groups than individuals. And then the other groups, and I guess that's what we've called communism. And the other groups say, hey, that doesn't make sense. We, 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 individuals are individuals, why should we put them in groups? We, we, but yes, it's true that we can't know enough about them, so let's just do nothing about it and hope that they'll balance, balance it out themselves. They're going to work hard or whatever. And I guess that's what we call capitalism. And while one model might have worked better than the other, I think both of them are pretty inefficient going forward. And then, so imagine we somehow figured out these goals sometime in the future. And at this point, it's pretty obvious it's not going to be like one or two or five goals, because we're talking about so many people. So maybe this is a huge, crazy network of a lot of goals, and there's something in it for everyone. Learning from the past, maybe at this point now, we, go, we need to go to step two and figure out a path for each person to this goal. And again, we have a lot of people, and we also have a lot of people. So this is not becoming any easier to imagine. It's just more complex and it's become crazier. And I'm also saying that technology can help us. So how on earth is that going to happen? Feels like, so the thing about technology is, and this is a great feedback I got from the TEDx people here. They said that, hey, whatever you're saying, people need to imagine this. So I'm going to say this to make it easier. The music you listen to today is personalized for you. The food and the clothes and the search results that you see online, these are tailored for you based on the data that's available, available from you. I do think that in the future, it is very easy to imagine that at some point, machine can create one education system per person so that we don't have to compete with each other to get better grades at things that we may or may not need. Instead, we can work with ourselves to be the best. We can grow to be the best we can possibly be. We work together. So you can be the best you can possibly be, and you can work to be the best you can possibly be. And then the next question is, so who gets to say where that possibility comes from for each of us? Or what, should machine tell us what's possible? Did they look at how we've lived the past 20 years of our life and say how you should live the rest of your life just because music recommendation works that way? Because that doesn't sound great at all. It sounds pretty horrible. And at this point, it feels like we're stuck between two options. One is an inefficient man-made system that's already failing us. The other is a crazy AI-made, tailored, individualistic, whatever education system. And between two bad options, one of them is going to kill us and maybe stay with the bad option that doesn't kill us. But I'm saying that maybe, hey, maybe there is another way, a third alternative in which we can leverage technology 
and build machines that can empower us to be where we want to be and abide by our core values. So here's my third alternative. I think by combining human values and the computation power of machines, there is an optimal zone in between these two, and that's, I think, where we should be going. That the assumption that we can never know enough about individuals to give them the right education for them is outdated. And we thought that way because we were not taking into account the power of technology and our ability to create values. The place I work at, I'm lucky to be working with a lot of people who have a very great way of articulating this. They say that machines are stupid, but great at computation and matchmaking. And humans are brilliant at creating values, but we're slow. And by combining these two, we could achieve a scenario in which we put us human, we put us humans in control of machines to create something that allows us to be the best we can possibly be. All I'm suggesting is we should learn from technology. Once upon a time, there was a wise teacher who would set a goal, set a desirable goal for us, and then guide us to that goal. Today, I think machines can be that guide to a desirable goal that abides by our human core values. This is what artificial intelligence means to me. And while a lot of people worry that AI may take over our lives and societies and etc., I think AI is going to allow us for the first time to do all the things that we've always wanted to do but never had the chance to. And that includes a personalized education, again, this time for everyone. Thank you.